And the belief that it is your job to somehow convert the rest of the world to not just democracy, but your version of democracy. And, you know, some countries are more sovereign than others. And it's those liberal democracies that take it upon themselves to kind of um, civilize the rest of the world. And if certain countries or, or, or leaders or people or cultures or religions reject that, well, then that's just simply anti-Western and they're automatically deemed authoritarian. Right? And that's not how it works. That's not how it works in the multipolar world. And yet that is the narrative that is fundamentally believed. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to Dr. Michael Rossi, who's a lecturer at Rutgers University in New Jersey, where he teaches political science and international relations, focusing especially on the connection between culture and politics. He's also the host of the YouTube channel Michael Rossi Polsai, on which he keeps publishing very valuable primary sources in the form of uncommented speeches as press releases from the, from the Russian state, you know, what they have been officially saying about what's happening in international re relations. And he's also making videos um, where he gives comments about what is happening in international relations. And recently, I've seen he's also started doing uh, very great interviews, like with the ever brilliant Nikolai Petro, whom we have had on this channel too. So uh, Michael Rossi is a, is a scholar and a YouTuber, and it's always a pleasure to talking to people who want to approach international relations publicly. And um, I'm happy to finally have him here on this channel. Michael, welcome. Thank, thank you, Pascal. Welcome. I hope that this is the first of many conversations that you and I have. Um, let me just also say that I appreciate the reach out, the email that you had sent me in less than a week ago, and uh, how quickly we were able to uh, coordinate and uh, lock in a time uh, to uh, to have a discussion. So I'm uh, delighted and honored to be uh, a guest uh, first time on your channel. And I'm very happy that you said yes so quickly because, you know, your channel is one of those that I've been following for, for quite a while now because you've been giving me very valuable information about what is happening in Russia. Uh, because I don't I don't speak Russian. Uh, I, that's, I don't speak Ukrainian. That's one of the problems I have. But then your your work is one of these gateways to get there to understand what these people are actually saying. Um, but before we go into your YouTube uh, uh, um, foray and, and what you're doing there, I would like to understand a bit, a little bit where you're coming from uh, academically and intellectually. I've mm -hmm. seen you doing, you're doing comparative political science. I've seen mm -hmm. you, you also do Greek uh, studies, political <laughs> things. I don't know. Can you please tell me a little bit? What's your, what's your <laughs> academic background? What fascinates you? In so um, I have been in the academic business now for more than 20 years. Um, yeah. As you uh, rightly point out, I do um, sort of a number of things within two major subfields of political science, comparative politics first, international relations second. Um, the two of them almost are always interconnected. I mean, you cannot do IR without comparative and um, and vice versa. So um, I got my uh, PhD in political science in 2009, specifically within comparative politics. And I was looking um, at uh, cultural approaches, the role of uh, cultural identity, and more uh, specifically, the importance of historical memory in how democratic transitions can facilitate a more qualitative understanding of democracy uh, within generally any other, you know, any country, uh, more specifically countries of the former Yugoslavia, and even more specifically, I was looking at Serbia um, as a primary case study. I have been to Serbia multiple times. I've lived in Serbia. I have colleagues there. I have sort of been a, uh, I guess, a, mm -hmm. an emotional academic attachment to uh, to the place. Um, and as you well know, you know, Serbia uh, remains one of those uh, partial pariahs within the uh, the European Union. Um, you know, it sort of has the audacity of uh, trying to get into the European Union on its own terms rather than being a little bit more subservient like the most, you know, the rest of the, you know, former Yugoslav republics uh, and disputed territories. Um, my channel I started, I think it was in 2017, 2018, really as a way of promoting uh, what I like to call public scholarship 
And, uh, you know, before I did any of the translations on the um, uh, Russian videos, whether it was Putin or Lavrov, um, you know, I realized that there was one major handicap that a lot of people within what I like to call institutionalized academia have, and that is they rarely, if ever, engage with the larger public. Um, we teach courses, we grade papers, we converse with people who pay university tuition, uh, but after four years, they graduate, they kind of move on, and, you know, it is a very much of, you know, some people call it the ivory tower, I call it a gated community, um, mm -hmm. you know, with one that uh, unfortunately has um, a rather uh, expensive paywall to access a lot of the academic journals. Um, so I started the YouTube channel really as a way of promoting my style of teaching and also just, you know, making my lectures at Rutgers uh, just openly accessible to the public. The whole initiative in translating uh, the videos, uh, the translating the speeches, the press conferences that uh, Vladimir Putin, Sergei Lavrov, and initially I'd also had done uh, Volodymyr Zelensky um, as well, was that um, at the outbreak of the start of the special military operation, there was um, really a lack of two things in the West. Number one, the entire speech, the entire address, the entire press conference that was given, they were oftentimes given in little bits and pieces for the media, and usually it was, you know, the most provocative thing that was said. But for the most part, these things were you know, sort of taken out of context. Um, and the second was that once the invasion had started, Western media had almost blocked everything coming out of Russia. Um, and everything that we get from the ongoing conflict in Ukraine for better or for worse, is largely taken on faith from what the Kiev government tells us. So, you know, there already is this uh, this sense of skepticism and mistrust coming towards Russia. And you know, I was, I don't know, I, I was in Tashkent at the, at the time, and I decided for my page, I was going to uh, post, because I had access to you know, the full speech that Putin had given, um, regarding his rationale for intervening in Ukraine. And I guess I had some time on my hands and I uh, provided the uh, the subtitles and the translations as primary sources, as, as you rightly point out, as primary sources. There's no edits, there's no opinions, there's no commentary. It is, take it as it is, and the page just blew up. Um, you know, prior to that, I had roughly over 8,000 subscribers uh, page started in 2017. Uh, the war started in February of 2022. And last I checked, I now have over 47,000 subscribers. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've constantly received from many of my followers is that, and I don't know if this is true or not, but, you know, I'm one of the few, if only YouTube channels that just simply provides these things um, as a public service. And I find it difficult. I, I, I really, I still can't believe that I'm the only one doing this. I mean, as you can see, I'm sort of a one man show here. I, there's, mm -hmm. this is not a business. This is not an organization. I am a, you know, a, an academic with a laptop and a Camtasia subscription. That's it. Um, but ju you know, just recently, just you know, I had posted um, a video that Putin had given to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, outlying his. Um, his terms of uh, of peace uh, for Ukraine, and you know, once again, just simply the raw material for the non-Russian, the non-Ukrainian speaking uh, population, and you know, if it does nothing else, then just simply provide um, you know primary source material to those interested. Well, mission accomplished. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> that's a that's a great mission to to have, you know, and uh, as somebody who also, you know, I, I never know whether I am an IR person or a historian. I never know because I mix <laughs> the two like and I, I never 
I don't I don't really agree with with uh, especially the, the the Western American way of like quantitative IR. I, I like qualitative approach, and then that always drags you automatically into into history. But anyhow, Absolutely. the point yeah. is, I appreciate primary documents. Yeah. I mean, it is great to read and hear things as people said it, and then use your own brain to make sense of it. Because as soon as it goes through commentary, you're getting the other person right. So and uh, the other person is very important. I think it is great when we have people like uh, the people I follow like the Duran and the judge and so on in order to hear what they think, how they make sense of it. But yeah. sometimes what you want is to hear what, what, what happened in order to make sense of it yourself, <laughs> in, in order to be your own commentator. And that's well, something right. you are providing. So Right, right. And, you know, and as an academic, I mean, I feel that one of the things that we, um, we, we don't take this pledge in academia, but, you know, we, we kind of do indirectly. And that is we have to be objective and we simply have to be neutral in all of this. Um, the reason why I, I, I decided to do this at the time, um, was, you know, I had been reading up on information leading to the, the outbreak of conflicts, uh, in Ukraine, really from, let's say late 2021 up to the outbreak of, uh, of the war in, in February. But even more to the point, I had been following events, uh, that had been taking place since 2014. Um, and chief of which, right, chief of which in my own, uh, in, in, you know, in my own personal uh, interest was the delaying, almost the deliberate scuttling of the Minsk agreements that yeah. uh, it had signed and implemented now, as we find from many Ukrainian officials, uh, would have avoided 90 percent of all of these problems Um would have ensured Ukraine's territorial integrity outside of the open issue surrounding Crimea um, and would have prevented all of this from uh, from happening. Um, th I mean, that's just an that's just an empirical observation on my end. And, you know, the Western media had automatically ascribed all blame, all responsibility uh, for this conflict on Russia. And look, we have to be honest here. Russia invaded another country. I mean, from Western media, it's very simple. One country invades another country. It's a very, you know, do-it-yourself narrative in that regard. Ukraine is defending its territorial integrity, its sovereignty, its independence, its fate, this, that, the other thing. You know, forget NATO, you know, pulling strings behind the scene. But it's very, very clear, right, that, what, that Russia was seen as the aggressor. But what I have to also say that I find very problematic is the West's and more specifically the U.S. and the U.K.'s proclivity to simply cast Putin as this comic book villain. Yeah, right? singular this, evil. Yeah, the singular the evil. He wakes, Hitler. Yes. Hitler. Yes. yes. Well, I mean, you know, Godwin's law it doesn't take long uh, in the West. You know, uh, count to 20. And by the time you reach 14 to 16, somebody will equate the current bad guy with, you know, Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Um, and I feel that that's a bit disingenuous because the West has been covering up a lot of its tracks and has been sort of recusing NATO of any responsibility for the outbreak of, uh, of this conflict. And the immediate commentary, as you point out, or as you rightly point out just a few minutes ago, in that we have commentary along with um, pieces of speeches and addresses, um, you know, puts the narrative already in one direction, right? It puts the burden of, um, of responsibility on Russia's part, but abrogates the West, NATO, Ukraine, Zelensky on everything else. So, you know, if nothing else, my job was simply to say, here's the entire speech, without the voiceovers that people find rather annoying and do with it as you will do with it as you will right if you if you go into this thinking that russia is the aggressor that putin is this evil person and you come out of it thinking that but with this fine if you change your mind fine if you think that there's more to the story here's the information it's simply and i try to remain as neutral as possible in this simply because um, it's just not provided. The Kremlin's website, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website does offer transcripts of these speeches in both Russian and in English, but they seem to be more interested in only focusing on their domestic audience. So as I said at the beginning, I used to 
translate speeches by Zelensky, but his government's YouTube channel, among others, have already provided the subtitles now, right? So for mm. them, it's in Ukrainian, it's translated into English. They're already doing what they should do. And I don't feel like I feel I, I don't feel like I'm doing something that the Kremlin or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs should do. But I know that there is a growing interest among many people around the world who don't yeah. speak Russian, who just simply want to get the unfiltered information and then draw their own conclusions. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting that you're mentioning that because the Kremlin to me always seemed to be much, much less interested in the public uh, public relations game in the West. Like yeah. uh, signaling toward Western general publics, and sometimes we call that uh, uh, public diplomacy and so on. That's that's not that what they have been engaged in very much. Whereas that's something that we see come out of the of the United States and of Europe much more towards their own. But also, I mean, uh, the 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 well the 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 populations in the yeah. within the kind of alliance system right um the the kremlin though sometimes does this like so whenever i find uh, these kremlin speeches in english and the, the the kremlin actually has also english versions of the homepage but then not all the content is provided in english but when they do yes. you know that this is something that they would like to be picked up um which which you know adds to the to to this kind of um uh, I think analysis that 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 we need to do, but then making it also available, especially these these broadcasts like the one miss the the speech Mr. Putin gave on Friday, which was a very important one because it was very yeah. strategically uh, provided a day before the Swiss Peace Summit, right? So in order to understand what's happening, you want to understand the ping pong going on between these actors that don't actually play with each other. And I think you're giving you're giving uh, you're providing access to part of that because the what we've seen from the West is trying to shut that out, which goes hand in hand with the vilification of the other one, because vilifying means you need to make sure that this actor is not understood. He needs to look irrational and evil, and then you have your perfect villain, and then you can like use military force to fight the villain. So I think making things more understandable is actually super important <laughs> for political, pur uh, uh, political science purposes. Yeah, um, you know, the, the role of narrative is really the driving force in foreign policy. Um, if I can maybe go a little bit more abstract here in mm -hmm. terms of my own um, studies within IR, um, I tend to identify primarily as a constructivist. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if, you know, your audience is familiar with the differences between realism, liberalism, and constructivism. Um, I like to say, right, constructivism- The, 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 holy, tri the holy trinity of IR. <laughs> yes, basically. I mean, you can throw in Marxism or institutionalism. There's a little downloadable mods for each one. I like to say, I like to say that constructivism is a downloadable mod to make mm -hmm. existing theories of IR more workable. <laughs> right. Because at the end of the day, constructivism focuses on the ways in which states perceive other states. Um, and so in that regard, it does a couple of things. It helps us understand why realism continues to be not even the prevailing theory, but really the only omnipotent philosophy within IR. But equally so, why liberalism um, falls on its biggest paradox. Liberalism tends to be, at least philosophically, much more peaceful, much more integrative, and it's a more proactive theory, um, a philosophy, yeah. that seeks to end the cycle of perpetual yeah. war. But yet, the whole notion and of realism believes that the road to global peace is paved with multiple wars, world wars, and regime changes because we need to make the entire world democratic, but more specifically, yeah. Western democratic. And, and and we need we need to point out that academic liberalism in IR is not the same as uh, political liberalism of the Democrat and the Democrats and so on. It's not it's not that that type. So it's 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 ah, an approach yes, yes, just yes. just for everybody to understand. Liberalism in our sense doesn't mean the liberals like uh, Ocasio Cortez. That's not what we mean. We mean an uh, an, an approach to study uh, studying IR. Uh, right. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Right. So when we talk about let's say. Uh, democratic liberalism, it's the individual rights of the citizen over the collective rights of the group. Um, you're absolutely correct. The IR approach to liberalism is seeped within the writings of um, John Locke, Immanuel yeah. Kant, Adam Smith, um, Woodrow Wilson, among others. But once we get to Wilson 
And once we get to, let's say, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and you know, subsequent U.S. presidents, begin to realize that liberalism tends to operate along um, an axiom of what I call selective diplomacy. So we will bemoan the lack of human rights in Russia. We will bemoan the lack of human rights in Afghanistan and Iraq, but we'll turn a blind eye to what's happening in Israel, to Saudi Arabia. You know, it's always funny. We never seek regime change in our allies, only those that we don't like. Um, you know, and, and in that regard, the realists... Um, and you know, I'm, I'm sure that you that you and your viewers are well familiar with the writings of uh, Professor John Mearsheimer, who is the reigning godfather of realism. The Pope, today. Pope of realism. Yeah, he is going through a he was going through what I like to call numerous victory laps of I told you so. He has yeah. been writing about this since the early 90s. Um I just want to, I, I, I met him once. Uh, he gave a talk at Columbia University a couple of years ago when he was, of all things, talking about his book, The Great Delusion, uh, which I absolutely recommend uh, reading. Although I have to say that as somebody who identifies as a constructivist, I say that most of his arguments could have been uh, made even more airtight <clears throat> if you approach it from that constructivist point of view. Because the United States, the UK, the EU view certain countries in one way over another. So, you know, for instance, if you know, we wake up tomorrow and the UK announces that they are going to be building uh, 10 new nuclear submarines, you know, as far as we're concerned, that's all fine, you know, jolly good. But if Iran or Russia or North Korea are announcing that they're going to be building 10 nuclear subs, well, th you know, this is an escalation of the uh, security dilemma. Um, so, you know, liberalism, as Mearsheimer uh, points out, I, I agree with, um, you know, is really more or less realism with a particular ideology. What I differ uh, from him is that, you know, all roads lead to realism. I mean, ultimately, um, there is a rational, logical ethos that the West operates in because they truly believe in the idea that the world can be democratized. Um, and I don't doubt the idea that democracy is universal, but where I find problematic is that the universality of democracy is some kind of evangelizing mission that is undertaken by the West, whether it's the US, the UK, the EU, you know, sort of you know, what have you um, in that regard. And so it is logical for larger countries like Russia and China, um, increasingly other countries like India, Iran, among others, to reject this notion. But rejecting it does not necessarily mean that they are anti-Western or that they're anti-American. But this is where constructivism comes in. By rejecting it, it is perceived in the West as being such, being anti-Western, anti-American, anti-democratic. Yeah, yeah. But we, we we can even go a step further further and make the argument by that by rejecting it it then delivers everything that the that the elites and the 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 people in power need in order to cast it and project it to Absolutely. their population Absolutely. as something which then it would would again turns it into like this this realist argument of using politics in order then to you know to create the enemy that you want to have and then and then and then get to the to the clash that that uh you know that's being pro that's being like put up there now for ten years the 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 future enemy and so on and so in this sense I think you know just to make this clear for for people out there I don't think that uh, that realism liberalism and constructivism work against each other they just have different points of departure and different different aspects of the same thing that you're looking at I really very much like the the image of the elephant right and the wise men who are around the elephant and one says it's an animal with a trunk the other one says <laughs> it's animal with a with a tail he goes no 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 it's it's an animal animal with a tusk and then they start fighting it's like no it's like <laughs> it has all of that stuff of course you just never get to see the whole thing at once um and that's uh, i i i think that the um looking at norms and what they do to people's minds how people perceive themselves i think that is absolutely essential 
uh, to to international politics. And it's interesting that you said that you your your uh, academic career also kind of comes out of like Serbia, former Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. because there we naturally see a lot of things that that we currently perceive as like highly hypocritical, right? Super hypocritical that that was st that started over there. Like let's take what happened to Kosovo or what yeah. NATO did to Kosovo yeah. and what Russia is doing to Crimea. And if you do a comparative politics um, thingy, you can say like, well, they're not exactly the same, but there's things that have been going on in both cases, right? And that's then where we get a little bit irky. It's like, ah, God damn it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I brought up the idea of the Kosovo precedent in my previous video when I was mm -hmm. analyzing uh, both the peace proposals, both, uh, you know, the one that, that Putin had given on the uh, 14th of June, and then what came out of the Switzerland Peace Summit, which was, yeah. now that I think about it, much more watered down than the original Zelensky formula that, uh, you know, that that uh, that was offered. But Putin did bring up this, uh, th this idea of Kosovo, which, uh, you know, as, as, as you know, as many of your viewers uh, already know, right, Russia supports Serbia's side on this idea of, you know, Kosovo being um, what I call a parastate. And some within the academic uh, uh, field refer to these territorial entities like Kosovo, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Northern Cyprus, uh, Transnistria as de facto states. Um, that's true, right? Th that is true. I mean, they are de facto states in reality. They they lack a sense of legal legitimacy and sovereignty, so they are not do your states. But I like the I like to use the term parastate because they are created in direct violation of another state's territorial integrity and sovereignty. So there is no coordination, right, between the host state that this entity broke away from and the entity that likes to proclaim itself, declares independence and, you know, cosplay itself as uh, as an independent country. And you know, Kosovo has been openly and uh, actively supported by, uh, you know, the, the primary powers of, of of NATO. And yet at the same time, these very same powers um, condemn um, Russia's uh, support for breakaway territories in Georgia, in Moldova. And of course, in um, Crimea. So I absolutely agree with the the double standards, the hypocrisy, and the idea that you know Kosovo really gave Russia a green light to say, well, you know, great powers can do whatever they do, and if we get condemned for what we're doing in Ukraine or Georgia. Um, you know, we can certainly point out, well, you know, you did it to Serbia. Why can't we do it here? I mean, you know, it 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 is a um, it's a realization that great power politics is back. And if you have the authority to do so, you can you, you know, you can absolutely do it. I find it also interesting that Kosovo was uh, a member. They they attended the uh, the Switzerland peace summit with Ukraine. And along Serbia with too. Serbia, along yeah. with Serbia. And, and they and both voted for the 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 the, uh, the, the communique. That's highly fascinating. I would really like to know what went through what 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 went through the minds of the of the diplomats who were doing that. Because if you're on the Serbian side, you will clearly think that we're going to use this communique in the future in order to argue our case against Kosovo. Because this right. is another precedent of Europeans. A, lo a lot of them agreeing that what happened, what ha the principle that happened in Kosovo is actually not admissible. <laughs> well, right. I mean, you know, I, the, the thing that I'm looking at with the Serbian side is that I, I know where they probably voted for, and that is yeah. where the communique upholds the territorial integrity of Ukraine. <clears throat> Perfect. Serbia is like, we have to vote for this, even though their breakaway slash wayward slash former slash disputed <laughs> territory also voted for it for completely different reasons. Right. So I'm just welcome to the world of absurdism. I mean, but, but you know. Yeah, it, it is absurd, but it, we need to embrace the absurdity, right? And then we need to work with it in order to make the absurdity understandable. One thing is that even within Kosovo, there is there are parts that would rather rejoin Serbia, right? There are still Serbs in Kosovo, and that's something yeah. that Kosovo doesn't uh, accept, right? My my integrity. So every even the ones who break away, they don't like the the, the other breakaway ones. Um, it's always the same, and that that's that's a that's a that's a 
traditional it's a classic in international relations right well let's bring this up i mean you know let's bring up one of the inconvenient realities is that the, you know the more pro west the more pro european and the more pro democratic pro american you are the more the less likely you are to grant minority rights to those uh, annoying little groups that uh, are you know are still there in your end, you know, Kosovo has to be almost nailed to the wall in order for them to implement an agreement that they made with Serbia 10 years ago, the Brussels Agreement of 2013, which says that they will legally sanction the creation of an association of Serbian municipalities that grants some kind of local self-competency to these communities that you point out in the north, the center, and the south, which are articulated within the Adasari plan that maps out Kosovo's sovereign raison d'etre. And yet they're saying, no, 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 we don't do that because it's going to give them independent powers. In the same way that Ukraine today wants to let you believe that they are the bastion of liberal democracy for Europe, and they are literally banning anything Russian yeah. within the country. Yeah. So if there ever was an opportunity for the Ukrainian government to try to tell those fence sitters who speak Russian, who might be more pro-Russian, but are hesitant to join this side, no, 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 the future of Ukraine includes you as well. They have failed miserably. They have absolutely failed miserably. And I'm not even going to bring up the idea that, you know, the rehabilitation of a whole bunch of anti-communist heroes in the 1940s is really a nice way of rehabilitating Nazi collaborators. I mean, and that's yeah, you know, that's where you, I, and a lot of people who watch us because they're they're actually they're looking for some sort of explanation and 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 sanity in 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 international in in in, in, in like political analysis. That's where we get angry because the speech acts and the reality that a certain group of people tries to create and 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 portrays and says <clears throat> this is real. This is the actual reality. And what we are seeing, especially when we go down the, the chain of what happened in conflicts, right? If you go 20, 25 years back in order to understand them, which is what we are supposed to do, then we find a, a utter discrepancy, right? Between mm -hmm. what is professor's reality and what we actually find in our own analysis of, of things. And this hurts. It hurts me. It's like this cognitive discrepancy then hurts. And then we need to somehow make sense of this because we also have the problem that we're li living in what we believe to be liberal societies where you know discourse reigns supreme and and freedom of expression and you know we're so enlightened because everybody can talk and then we always figure out what's correct we always mm -hmm. know what's real but the people who say that are the ones who then reject this kind of reality on the ground that is so barely clear to the eye um, I mean, and um, this is a problem to us um, yes. uh, to me at least um, this doesn't make sense. Well, that makes two of us. I mean, that makes two of us. I mean, I have dealt with um, a significant amount of uh, cognitive dissonance, um, mm -hmm. not just within the academic world, but you know, especially within the policymaking world. I can I can understand the policymaking world. I can understand that because you have an agenda, you have a purpose, you have a goal, right? You're yeah. paid to effectively be this you know type of biased. Um, in the academic world, it really depends. I mean, there are some, you know, people like Mearsheimer certainly um, has, um, he hasn't said anything that deviates from his um, positions over the past 30 to 35 years. No, he's very consistent. Yes, very consistent. yes. Um, but you also mention, um, you know, one of our mutual colleagues, uh, you know, Dr. Nikolai Petro, whom I've known and uh, have been a good friend and colleague uh, with for now about 20 or so years. Um, he actually served as my outside reader for my mm -hmm. dissertation back in ah. 2009. I mean, so he has been, um, you know, more than willing to be a guest speaker um, not just on my channel, but in my classes where I teach, uh, you know, studies of post-communist transition, Russian foreign policy, you know, among others. Um, you know, he certainly has his critics who see him as more pro-Russian than Ukrainian, um, although his his knowledge of Ukrainian politics is unquestioned. And his uh, personal connection to Ukraine as well. It's like... He has absolute personal connections to it. There's no question about it. Um you know, he's written, you know, numerous articles about it. One of the articles that I find uh, the most useful, um, among other things, simply because of the um, the title, is his article, Are We Reading Russia Right? 
Hmm. And the title of this article is, is effectively the, the question of the day. You know, are we reading Russia right? Are we perceiving them right? Or are we just presuming that they are the simple um, mono uh, mental aggressor that they are? This isn't meant to condone. This isn't meant to excuse the invasion or their own um, actions within the conflict, but to suggest that NATO, Ukraine, the West had no responsibility for the outbreak of conflict in February and the continuation of that conflict up until now um, requires a lot of leap in logic, you know, in my part. Um, like I said, it doesn't get Russia off the hook. Russia has its own responsibilities for what it does and whatever. But at the same time, I'd like to think that as an academic, could this have all been um, avoided? Could the West have reached an agreement with Russia to simply designate Ukraine as neutral territory, um, non-aligned? You know, Russia has said they had absolutely no problem with Ukraine eventually joining the European Union. NATO was a red line item. The same thing goes with Georgia and uh, and Moldova. Um, and, you know, for some, this is, you know, quite a reasonable compromise from Moscow. If you're on Team West, if you're on Team NATO, no negotiations with Russia whatsoever. There are certain countries, you know, if you are, yeah. if, if you ascribe to that whole idea of Team Western liberalism, and here this is, you know, IR liberalism, okay? There are countries that you just simply don't, that you just simply don't treat with. Russia, China, Cuba, Iran, among Syria, you know, North, North Korea. Korea. North Korea. It's getting bigger. Actually, the list is getting bigger and bigger. Well, the list gets bigger and bigger, but you know, it's sort of like um, you know, I've you know, I'm I'm a citizen of the United States. I've lived here, you know, all my life, except when I'm living overseas. You know, we're the only great country in the world that says to things like, you know, we don't want to deal with Cuba because we don't like you. We're not going to deal with North Korea because we don't like you. We're not going to deal with Iran because well, we don't like you. It's like you're either insanely powerful for you to say that, or you are stuck in a time warp desperately trying to convince not only yourself but the rest of the world that it's 1993 yeah and it doesn't work anymore the world is multipolar and if you still want to believe that you're the only unipolar power in the world and that everybody that doesn't follow you immediately is an enemy i mean you know i i know that i'm making this more simplistic than it is but i mean it's it's no wonder that the only friends the united states has is countries of NATO and the EU, which I have to say at this point, EU is little more than the economic appendage of NATO, and NATO is the military wing of the United States. I, I know, I mean, we are sort I, of gravitating. I, 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 I completely agree. I mean, NATO has morphed from something relatively weak back in 49 into something extremely strong these days, yeah. and into a, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, this, this famous dictum of um, Hastings, the first genera um, secretary general, right? NATO's purpose is to keep the Americans in, the Germans down, and the Russians out. Or yes. like, uh, I think uh, those, yeah, were the, the, those that's three. the original three. That's the, the original three. In, the Germans down, the Russians out, the English relevant, and the French happy. Ah. <laughs> that, that that's an even more lovely is an even yes, more lovely five. Know. But by now, by now, it's really like a a instrument in all the. It's an instrument of 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 power projection, right? And the fascinating thing to me, and why I think that uh, the next twenty years we're going to have a lot of scholarship to do, is because we are going through when it comes to Europe, to Western Europe, uh, we have an utter crisis of realism. Because what these European states are doing currently is not in their own best interest. They are actively ignoring things like the fact that, you know, somebody just blew up one of the biggest infrastructure projects of Europe, right? And they just turn a blind eye to it. And they are willing to risk nuclear nuclear war in Europe, you know, uh, over yeah. the interests of the patron state. And this is this is going to be very hard to explain in, in, in realist terms. That's where this is then where we need other things to happen. And this is what's 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 causing a lot of issues for for me right now to to wrap my head around it. But part of that thing is of course a mental spiral and uh, of 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 maybe even a mass formation event where you start believing an, uh, a, f a version of reality, which once you step out of it, will look absolutely utterly dumb. 
But when you're inside it, it's a little bit like like Jehovah's Witness or like uh, Scientology. You know, once you're inside the bubble, you're kind of <laughs> you're completely engulfed by it. Uh, that's the only thing that makes sense to me in order right. to explain why these countries don't act in their rational self-interest. You know, I was thinking about this. Uh, not too long ago, I've actually been thinking about this for the last couple of days about, you know, is it rational for Europe to think the way uh, that it does? You know, within the European Union, and let's just conflate, the EU and NATO are by and large, you know, pretty much the same thing. Um, overlap, you know, huge you, overlap. Overlap yeah. for the most part, you know, lose a country, gain a country, you know, but it, it's sort of like the, the main countries are the ones that are in both the EU uh, and NATO. And the, and, and the alpha countries, the ones that really count, you know, you have Germany, France, Italy, um poland let's just you know think of um just think of those four and uk when you count um nato but the uk is just going to go along with whatever the united states says and there, there's no question about that yeah um <clears throat> any ideology sounds absolutely convincing when you are surrounded by nothing other than that ideology um and the idea of liberalism, both IR liberalism as well as more political philosophical liberalism, predicates itself on prioritizing civil liberties over national security. But the only group of people that can do that are those that are absolutely certain that their national security is assured and taken care of. So in other words, if you live in a gated community, you know, and, you know, pick your city, New York, as you know, Tashkent, London, Berlin, wherever. If you live in the good neighborhoods, the wealthy, the affluent neighborhoods, crime is not really an issue. Poverty is, you know, on the outskirts. Um, you know, you surround yourself with... Um, people who are like you, even to the point where, you know, blue collar industries are the service sector. You're more, you're not even white collar, you're intellectual collar at this point. You can think these lofty things. You know, Lavrov constantly brings up this, um, this allegory that uh, Borrell once mentioned about the EU, right? That the it's garden. this garden, right? The garden that needs to be maintained against the jungle <clears throat> outside. And you know, Lavrov does not do this to um, to to spite, but to bring up this idea that if you are living within the garden, you truly believe that the garden can and should spread to every other place, you know, on Earth. That's the whole notion of uh, democratic peace theory. <clears throat> and if you disagree with that, well, then you can be chided for thinking that, you know, A, uh, democracy is incompatible with other parts of the world. B, you know, you're an Orientalist because certain cultures are incompatible with that. How dare you say that? You know, da, 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 da. Um, something similar came up uh, many, many years ago when George W. Bush was still president. And you'll, you, you're, you're, you remember him, right? At the time, he was war criminal number one, but now we have rehabilitated him because, you know, he's much more acceptable and palatable than Donald Trump. And he and Michelle Obama shared a cough drop at uh, Nancy Reagan's funeral or something like that. So the best of friends. Anyways, Bush at one point was, at, was attending some press conference and some journalist, I don't remember when or where, but had said to him something to the effect of, um, you know, is it worth all the time and effort and money and resources and manpower to democratize Iraq? And Bush, I actually have to give him credit for this. I think he was honestly honest about this. Um, he was unbelievably naive, but yes, he was honest about this. And he kind of looked at the journalist and he said, are you somehow insinuating, I'm paraphrasing, but are you somehow implying that the Iraqis don't deserve democracy, that they don't deserve liberty, that they don't deserve freedom? You know, why do some people deserve democracy and others don't? And of course, it left the journalist, you know, dumb. And because it's a statement that you can't counteract. But with this in mind, the belief that it is your job to somehow convert the rest of the world to not just democracy, but your version of democracy. And it's a type of democracy. It's a type of liberalism that Glenn Deason 
who in his book, Russophobia, and I highly recommend everyone to read uh, Deason's book on Russophobia, right? He points out this idea of, um, um, I forget the, the, the right, it's sort of asymmetrical democracy or, um, you know, some countries are more sovereign than others. And it's those liberal democracies that take it upon themselves to kind of um, civilize the rest of the world. And if certain countries or, or or leaders or people or cultures or religions reject that, well, then that's just simply anti-Western and they're automatically deemed authoritarian. Right? And that's not how it works. That's not how it works in the multipolar world. And yet that is the narrative that is fundamentally believed by U.S. presidents, U.K. prime ministers, German chancellors, French presidents, EU commissioners, whether they're high, medium, mediocre, or low, you know, it doesn't matter. For them, we have cornered the market on ideological morality. And all you have to do to pass that threshold is simply wave the right flag and say, I like the West, I like the EU, I like America, I hate Russia, I hate communism, I hate uh, China, I hate anything else like that. And you'd be surprised what you can get away with. And it would be believable if the allies of the West weren't as corrupt, nepotistic, reprehensible people as they are. But we see, unfortunately, Ukraine descend into, I don't even, it, it's its not even um, autocracy. It's just simply non-democracy. You know, Zelensky has completely um, 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 canceled all future elections. And yet no his, one complains about that. His term no ran one. out. His term yeah. ran out. His term ran out. His term ran out. And there was no rationale for, I mean, if he thinks about it, I mean, if you think about it, he was like, well, there's no point in we can run an election during a war. You know what? Play it smart. Run the elections where you know you can run in central and western Ukraine. Yeah, but the Lviv, I mean, the Kiev, the Ivo Frankivs region are going to overwhelmingly vote for a pro Western, pro NATO, pro EU guy. It, it 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 is so ridiculous because what he's saying is like, okay, Ukraine is a sovereign, independent state, and Ukraine is doing everything it can, including uh, fighting a war, running schools, having electricity, water, uh, you know, everything, laws, prisons, and so on. The only thing, the only thing we can possibly do is is elections. Unfortunately, yeah. it's the only thing, and it's uh, uh, okay. Anyhow, sorry, I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> cognitive dissonance. Well, here. I but, mean. It, it, you know, and and again, not to give Putin credit for this, but he's pointing out chapter and verse in the Ukrainian constitution how there is no justification or legal grounds for this. And as far as he's concerned, the only legitimate body of authority in Ukraine is the Vahovna Rada. Right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Right? That is it. Now, you, again, you take him for how he is. You think he's great, fantastic. You think he's a you know a, a maniac. What you know, fantastic. It's just as good. But it feeds into the Russian narrative that this whole idea of the West upholding the principles of liberal democracy um, is hollow. You know, of course, you... this. So what we need to recognize at this point, and it's really sad, is that liberal democracy is a discourse used by certain groups of people in order to make the masses go along with the policies that they want. I mean, that's the only explanation I have. And maybe these people believe in it. Maybe these people actually think in these terms and maybe they're able to just do the switch off, like say like liberal democracy above anything and everything while still having like super weapons trade with uh, Israel and, and with Saudi Arabia too, right? And, and and include Saudi Arabia in that gang. And they're maybe, maybe mentally they're able to just turn a blind eye to that and not even so that it doesn't hurt them mentally, right? right. And then they, they suddenly become, ah, you know, we need to accept other cultures and stuff like that. So but the... And, and, and then and then the other side, the, the interesting thing, and that's, I think, where it is important, especially what you're doing to come back to this one to translate, is that when we when we especially when we use a, a realist lens and we try to understand why people take certain decisions, why a country do, do certain things is we need to understand how they reason on the inside. Right. Apart from the way that they're being portrayed. And, and yeah. this is the black box here. This is what we need to crack, because that's the only thing that matters for the decisions taken. Mm -hmm. And it took my it took me a long time to understand why neutrality failed for Ukraine. You know, this really threw me into a uh, 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 
uh, disbelief because I thought it is so obvious. And I, it, ne it took me time to understand that it was not Russia that sabotaged it, it was the West that sabotaged it. It made it impossible because that's not what they want. They want the hard border. They want the, 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 the war was not necessarily, you know, planned from the beginning, but it was something they were willing to take because it's going to be the Ukrainians who do the dying anyhow. And the, so this took me a long time, <laughs> this realization. But the, the, this decision, why the Russians said like, okay, this is it, we're marching in, that we cannot get to there to that without actually opening this black box that this is something that you try to provide. I mean, pieces to that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is where constructivism, this is why I always, always go back to constructivism because as you, as you just said, right, liberalism has its ideology. It has its ethos. It has its morality until you start scrutinizing it until you start realizing that uh, some of the closest strategic partners for the big key liberal states in the world have some of the worst and most appalling human rights records, you know, in existence right now. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, Israel is effectively committing the closest thing to state-sponsored genocide that we have seen in yeah. nearly 80 years. I mean, you know, at, at this point, the cat's the cat's out of the bag. This isn't even interpretation. This isn't even uh nuance. This is just raw empirical evidence that is being witnessed. And yet you will see the very same countries that seek to excuse those actions, um, pushing a narrative that wants you to believe that Russia is committing genocide in Ukraine, that Serbia committed genocide uh, in Bosnia, not even in Bosnia, but just simply in one town in Srebrenica, which is that, that in and of itself is a minefield to bring up. You, talk, you mentioned that I had, uh, you know, I deal with politics and culture in the Balkans. That is a minefield to walk yeah. through. Yeah, that is a minefield because no matter what narrative, no matter what side you take, you're invariably going to annoy two other sides. Yeah, um, just because everybody is engaged in their own form of incestuous um, historical memory. That's something we can maybe talk about down the road here. Yeah, that's something we can do down the road here. But when it comes to uh, what I think you and I both agree on as the the limitations of liberalism. Realists like Mearsheimer and Walt, Stephen Walt, um, these are the two big, you know, two top ones today. Even back in the day, like the, the original true ultra godfather of realism, Ken Walt, who wrote his phenomenal work, uh, Man, the State and War, along with the theory of uh, international politics, would have you understand that liberalism is at the end of the day, realism with an applied ideology. Mm. That is ultimately it. One of Mearsheimer's arguments, and when I say, uh, when, when I'm quoting Mearsheimer, I'm not saying that I support this, I'm just simply quoting it for the sake of putting it out there. In his book, The Great Delusion, he says that liberalism only works as liberalism when the liberalist great power is a unipolar power. So we're talking about the United States in the 1990s, um, let's say the UK, perhaps in the early 20th century, um, because there's nobody to oppose it. But the minute that another power rises, and within the study of international relations, the study of unipolarism, bipolarism, multipolarism, I mean, great powers, will it's inevitable that they will rise. Um, it's just, it just it just happened. I mean, Thucydides have been talking about this over three thousand years ago. These things happen. So the rise of China, the return of Russia, the regional influence of India and Iran. You know, this doesn't have anything to do with the fact that it's an anti-American coalition. It's just that eventually new powers, new states, new regions rise, and they have their own, you know, ethos. <clears throat> Russian foreign policy, Chinese foreign policy. There's nothing inherently sinister about it, right? Chinese foreign policy is very simple. Um, we can do business with you so long as you don't recognize the independence of Taiwan, right? That's it, it's, it's, it's Chinese foreign policy in, in, in a nutshell. Russian foreign policy, interestingly enough, I teach a course on this and I've, I've taught it uh, multiple times at Rutgers, um, at Fordham University. Um, some, some of the most phenomenal students I had was last fall at my Fordham uh, class, just a little shout out to my Fordham kids. And you know, Russian foreign policy operates within the ethos of A, the world is multipolar, 
B, the world is multilateral, and C, Russia is not seeking to supplant the United States, but simply to recognize that it is among at least three or four other powers, a, a global power with regional interests, regional security interests. You can take it however way that you want. But if the U.S. still sees that as a challenge to its own hegemony, then that's really one of two, that, that, that creates two problems. One, the U.S. creates its own security dilemmas. And number two, there is probably, in my opinion, one of the best scholars out there on the, the, the phenomenon of unipolarism, right? the idea that there's one power out there that tries to run the world, and the understanding that unipolarism sows the seeds of its own demise is Christopher Lane. Christopher Lane has been writing some excellent work on unipolarism since the mid-1990s. He wrote this article in the mid-90s called The Unipolar Illusion. I think it was published in, I could be wrong, International Security, but I could be wrong. And even as early as the mid-90s, he said to himself, the United States as a unipolar power is operating on borrowed time because eventually new powers will rise and it is up to the United States to decide what to do with those new powers. They can recognize those new powers and be seen as a benevolent but declining hegemon that sees its position as one among a new group of great powers in the world, or it can resist, or it can see these powers as challengers, as rivals, as threats to security. And if we play, if, if we use the constructivism card and we take at face value how the US perceives certain countries, it makes all sense that the United States is going to see, perceive Russia, China, Iran, and even India as rivals, not as partners. And they're going to realize that the leadership in power at the time does not want to be the one to relinquish it. You know, you don't want to be the captain that uh, steers the ship towards sinking. So in that regard, you want to hold on to this idea of American omnipotence as much as possible. And you're holding on to an ideology that, you know, not only is outdated, but has disproven itself multiple times with Kosovo, with Iraq, with Libya, with Syria, with Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan was, in my opinion, probably the best example of the end of American unipolarism. And the idea now that we are effectively giving Israel carte blanche to do what it wants. So you either throw liberalism out and say, look, America, stop trying to convince us that you're the defender of human freedoms in the world. You're just a great power with your own great interests and your own strategic interests and be honest about it. And we would actually respect you more for that. Yeah. Like you I know could actually see that. I could see that. Again, I'm saying this as an academic, as somebody who is, you know, I, I've read the stuff, I've looked at it all, and I'm like, if this were any other country, we would see the United States as just simply a great power that is trying to reposition itself to reflect new global realities. And it's using an ethos, it's using an ideology that, you know, you need to update the brochure, guys. The brochure says one thing. Reality says, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you apply to a university and the brochure gives you all of this. And then you go to the you would go to the university and you're like, oh, budget cuts have, you know, killed that program and that building got knocked down and we don't have that anymore and whatever it is. And it's like, listen, the brochure, it's like you go to a you go to a university and you're taking a class with a, you know, well-venerated old school professor who hasn't updated the syllabus since 1994. You know, it's like Times are changing. It's, but you know, what fascinates me is that there, as you, you pointed out, there's nothing really new to this, not just to the principle of what's what's at work, also to the to the forces at work. Some of the most interesting people I've, I've talked to uh, lately are, are, are uh, uh, scholars, uh, Arta Moeni and, and, and Christopher Mott, who pointed out beautifully in, in a very nicely well-written article, how this tension between realism and liber liberalism before the invention of modern IR was already playing out ideologically between Washington and Jefferson. And you know how how they, there were different visions 
of how the country should work and uh, and they were competing from the beginning and we find this in other places too so there's something very human very innate in in the disagreement and then out of the disagreement and out of the inability to completely uh, capture the state uh, yeah. then come contradictory policies and they together with 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 policies from others they didn't make up the world and i keep saying look we are eight billion people on a planet that is self-organizing and we are unfortunately bad at self-organizing <laughs> <laughs> um i i don't know like it's but the u.s fascinates me in this sense because from the very beginning its foundations is very philosophical you know and you can see this play out and washington was of course a pro-neutralist he was not isolationist well today you would call him isolationist um but he was a neutralist whereas well, uh, jefferson was an interventionist more or less it's like uh, we need to help the french we need to go to the, to europe we need to intervene uh for it's spreading the garden, right? Right. Um, I um, and I find that fascinating over time. <laughs> yeah, you're you're absolutely correct. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out with that is that the school of liberalism, and this is pointed out by many um, realists and neo-realists, Morgenthau and E. H. Carr was one of the actually E. H. Carr who wrote uh, this great work, the Twenty Years Crisis. He's not he he wasn't a realist. He was more of a Marxist. But I like to say that I are like Marxists in IR theory are like realists that are really pessimistic about it. They hate being realists. OK, you know, but I I, I recommend people uh, check out Carr's work, the 20 years crisis. But what they all say is that the the biggest problem with liberalism is its highest virtue. And that is liberalism is the one IR theory that does not that is not ashamed to have an ideology, but they wear that ideology like a badge. And the problem with that ideology is that you cannot spread that ideology throughout the world. And the ideology in, in, in academic sense is upholding the belief that there are universal rights, universal human rights, right? Life, liberty, and property. In a more vernacular, vulgar sense, it's the idea, if you're coming at it from a liberalist state standpoint, like the US or before that, the UK, and that is the idea that there's something horrible happening over there and we have to do something about it, right? There's human rights abuses that are happening over there. There's genocide happening over there. There is famine there's mass murder there's something hard we can't just simply uphold principles and do nothing about it if we have the ability to do something about it we're going to do it in the cold war two things galvanized the united states towards this one was the civil war of dissolution in bosnia well actually in yugoslavia but we focused on bosnia and the other one was um somalia if you remember somalia right somalia and that was just simply the idea of just starving people and we saw them on TV. We saw starving children. We saw starving people. And we're like, we have to do something about this. We cannot sit by and do nothing. Now, that from the liberalist brochure is quite noble because it means that if we have the power to intervene for the force of good, we will do so. In the real world, it doesn't work like that. In the real world, we feel you know, the pangs of humanitarian necessity in countries and regions where we don't have any vested interest in. So human rights abuses will take place in Saudi Arabia. We won't do anything. Open genocide is happening against the Palestinians. We will not do anything about that. Um, human rights abuses have continued unabated since the Taliban came back to power in Afghanistan. We don't care about that anymore, right? So we're forced to look at places that, you know, the media wants us to look at. You know, Ukraine, um, among one thing. And, you know, prior to that was, you know, pick the people that you want to suddenly feel sorry for um, and ignore, you know, all the rest. Okay. 
which in that sense kind of abrogates the whole notion of liberalism. And it's really more done out of self-interest and, you know, opportunism. Right? It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, that's that's where that's where liberalism collapses into exactly. just a, a, a tool of power of, of, of a, a realist world. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, let's go back to Kosovo. We intervened in Kosovo because we felt like we had to stop human rights abuses. OK, yeah. we did. But what did we end up doing? We reversed the human rights abuses. So the people that were previously being abused are now abusing the Serbs. And the Serbs that yeah. are resisting, the Serbs that are resisting in Kosovo are now seen as anti-democratic Russian agents, Serbian nationalists, people who just can't see, you know, the realities of the day. Last I checked, Kosovo is not an independent country and it's not the 194th member of the United Nations. So in that regard, Serbs that are, you know, fighting back against what they openly see as absolute aggression from a government that likes to mask itself as pro-democratic and pro-Western, but it's ultimately just nationalistic, ethnocentric, and xenophobic, but they, you know, they use the right hashtags and they have the right photo ops with the right EU officials and get away with it. And, you know, increasingly with the rise of social media, alternative journalism, um, numerous, you know, podcasts and YouTube channels, but Telegram um, channels as well, many begin to see, um, I don't want to say an alternative, but they begin to see the stuff that doesn't make it into that, 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 you know, is that doesn't make it into the very sanitized media propagandized. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. General There's public. Stuff, yeah. yeah. The stuff that makes the stuff that doesn't make it into New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, Spiegel, you know, all that kind of good stuff, um, which, you know, go back to our discussion of narrative, go back to our discussion of propaganda and anti-propaganda. Anybody that brings up something about what they see in Telegram in the West is automatically going to be seen as pro-Russian. There's nothing yeah. pro-Russian about Telegram, mm -hmm. but it's just simply unfiltered. Yeah. And, but and the burden of the burden of authenticity is oftentimes laid at your doorstep. Whereas those that just simply quote chapter and verse from, you know, WAPO, New York Times, um, The Atlantic, um, or other Western-backed NGOs can say whatever they want. And when someone asks, what are your sources? Do trust me. Yeah, exactly. It's That's also a very, very ancient and old way of not just of, of control or of perceiving the world. You know, this goes back, I mean really far you know for 1000 years the bible was read out only in latin because that gives the, the the priest the power of interpreting it and nobody else is nobody else even knows what it actually says so you you depend on the word and that's literally what they fought a war over in europe right in, in, with, with the protestants who, who had the audacity to translate the bible so you can understand it yourself <laughs> it's it, it's so old this um and th there's a very interesting word in german that we have like um uh, deutungshoheit the the sovereignty of interpretation it's yeah. sovereignty of interpretation and this is something that ideologues want to keep to themselves so that's why they don't like unfiltered information and and that because that is that is that allows the masses to make their to make up their own minds um the it really it really really fascinates me how this works but then also inside like psychologically for people and that's where i think and we have to bring it back uh we can close the loop i think that's where your channel comes in um as a as a great source of primary information for people to actually look and do their their investigations that's what they should do and you should never trust anyone you shouldn't trust putin you shouldn't trust me you shouldn't trust maybe you should trust you i mean we cannot escape ourselves yeah, but... i have my own internal i have my <laughs> we, own internal we, battles <laughs> we we cannot escape ourselves but we shouldn't trust anyone blindly because not just because these people might be lying it's because they might not know that they are wrong right the the best liars are always the ones who believe their own lies because right. they they are not aware of the fact that what they're saying is untrue so with that in mind everybody um check out uh, michael uh, rossi's uh, channel um he publishes a lot of very uh, useful content. Is there any other place where people can follow you, Michael? Um, you know, I have a, let me think now. YouTube is my primary uh, site right now. Um, I do have a LinkedIn profile, which I haven't mentioned, I haven't updated in <laughs> quite a while. Um, but um, what I can do is I know that I mentioned a lot of um, articles and books uh, that I would recommend uh, to be read, but on my LinkedIn page, um, 
I think I have links to the articles that I've written. I have a lot of stuff that I've written about conflict resolution uh, mm -hmm. in Kosovo, the role of culture in terms of democratic uh, transition. Um, and at the other thing is a lot of people just email me at my uh, my email account, which is uh, Mike Rossi Polisci at gmail.com asking for links to articles or books or other things like that. And, you know, I always, uh, you know, try to respond um, as quickly as possible. You know, if uh, if this is, if you like, I mean, I'm happy to continue the conversation in future uh, discussions with you on you know, many of these topics. We should. You know, one of my things is I want to do a little bit, on the one hand, I want to do uh, counter propaganda to what I see as, as being relentless from this side. On the other side, I want to forge a network of people also on YouTube in order to kind of help make sense and connect people who I think make sense. Uh, uh, so we should we should continue the discussion and maybe also bring a, a talk with Nikolai Petro and, 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 yeah, and, and others. So. Um, but we we are already over one hour, so uh, we have to uh, wrap it up. <laughs> uh, Michael Rossi, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me, and uh, I look forward to future conversations with you as well as your viewers. Uh -huh.